Hi, and welcome to RBP on JSB. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine, and today we're going to be discussing the second movement of Bach's Sonata No. 3 in C major. By the way, if you want to hear a discussion about many of the various topics that pertain to all of the sonatas and partitas, please be sure to watch the overview episode. So this C major fugue is incredible. You know, the Chacon has the reputation, it gets all the kudos, but to me, the miracle of the cycle is this fugue, both compositionally and even spiritually, emotionally. I just think this is the ultimate. And um, interestingly, it's the longest fugue that Bach ever wrote for any instrument or combination of instruments. You might have thought that his longest fugue would have been for organ or harpsichord, one of the keyboard instruments. Um, you might have thought that it might have been for ensemble, but no, it's for our little four-stringed instrument, the violin. So that's a pretty big compliment to the violin on the part of Bach, I think. Um, the fugue subject is totally different, complete departure from the little um, fugue subjects of the other two. slightly longer subject, it's much more lyrical. And in fact, speaking of it being lyrical, it actually comes from a chorale tune, um, which I won't attempt to pronounce the German here on video and embarrass myself, but the translation is something like, Come Holy Ghost, Creator and God. So obviously Bach liked that melody. Um, the big question about this fugue subject is, do we start down bow or do we start up bow? I started down bow for years because somehow starting down bow at the start of this movement feels good. But if something feels good isn't always a good reason if it doesn't phrase as well. And I, when I went back to singing it, I realized that bars one and three that those have the emphases, and it would be really nice to have both of them on down bows. And after all, the first note is actually a pickup. It's somehow, when, you know, the, each new iteration of the subject comes in, we like to do it on a down bow. It's just very tempting. But in fact, if you think about the phrasing and the fra let the phrasing take precedence, it all starts to make sense. <laughs> some squirrely things like maybe add a second up bow here to get back to an up bow. Listening for those major sevenths. Now that is a down bow but preceded by a down bow where it matters on this. And I actually set up doing up, up, for the sake of the four note chord, I actually let it as it comes because that's a de-emphasized bar and then down bow, de-emphasized, then emphasize, then down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow. So as I'm going through the entire fugue and it would be a three hour long video if I talked through my decision about every single measure of this fugue. But, um, and, and I do keep changing my mind about certain things because there are so many different equally possible solutions. But really the thing to do that I would really urge you to do is to decide what you want your phrasing to be. And then decide what bowing best fits the phrasing. And then whether four note chords come out on downs or ups or things like that is really the least important consideration. Whatever you're gonna do in this fugue, it is so dense, you're gonna end up with lots of four note chords on up bows, there's no help for it. And frankly, if you use a Baroque bow, they're really not that bad. In fact, they're pretty comfortable once you get used to it. It's not like trying to do a four note chord on an up bow with a modern bow, which is virtually impossible and totally clunky and super annoying. So um, really figure out what bowings fit your phrases and then how to get to those bowings and what compromises you have to make with various up ups and all those good things. Now, of course, it's important to play just 
whichever is the most important voice when you're figuring out your emphasis pattern and therefore your bowings that you're going to put on top of those emphases to help them. It's also important to play other voices that are not the main voice. So to kind of go along and play, you know, the A string voice or the top voice or the middle voice or the bottom voice, whatever, however you want to call it at any given moment, play the voices separately as if it's the second violin part of the quartet or the viola part of the quartet or whatever it is. This fugue actually goes into as many as four voices sometimes, which is just incredible. Um, and getting to know each voice separately as a separate part and then putting them together and letting your ear listen to various of them as you're going along to make sure that they're all sounding good. And actually, if you want a really fun transcription, there's something called Bach for Two, B-A-C-H-F-O-R, and then numeral two, which you can find online. Um, it's a transcription um, that a colleague of mine made of all the three fugues into violin duets. So you're playing only half the notes and it allows your ear to somehow hear a, a, with more clarity than you end up doing when you're just trying to play all the notes or even play the voices separately but the other ones aren't being played. I just find that it's really illuminating to play those Bach for two duets. Thinking of playing the four note chords though, make sure that you remember that the beat doesn't start until you get to the top voice. So first of all, no downward stuff. You can find a few spots where it works and there are other spots where maybe there's overlapping important voices. So do you roll down for the lower voice, up for the upper voice? It becomes a logical muddle, but it also simply doesn't sound that good and it's totally against um, historically informed Baroque performance practice, which in a way is not an argument in and of itself. We don't do something just because it's historic. If we prefer something else artistically, that for sure would take precedence. But um, the idea of rolling downwards to bring out the lower voice is just not a valid argument because you can bring out the lower voice without rolling downwards and it's going to be prettier. So measure 56. <laughs> Remembering that you don't get to the beat, let's see, um, maybe let's start from measure 14. Um, don't try to stay to the metronome. Right, no beating along. So instead, You can delay beats ever so slightly in order to make those chords more natural as long as you then start your beat again once you get to the top of the chord. But to have to steal too much from the previous note to squeeze in the before beat stuff, which is you know all the pre-beat notes, which are all of the bottom part of the chord. If I'm gonna play measure 15 and stick to the metronome, I'm gonna have to clip this F so much that it's really displeasing. So playing a good F and then kind of adding a little extra time. That's really the better solution and really imperceptible to your audiences as such because they'll just feel whenever the beats happen and something like this, you know, is it's simply not possible to execute what's actually on the page. It's all a big fake job. We're implying this and implying that, but we're not actually playing four violin parts at the same time, right? We're not, you know, we're not, we, we don't play the piano. We can't just go clunk. Um, remembering which voice is the most important is very key at any point in time. I will often take a highlighter pen and kind of, you know, highlight just, you know, like a little line through the notes. You know, maybe it's upper voice, maybe it's middle voice. Some of them are easy to miss, like the middle of, oh, let's see, what is this, 16. Um, starting in the middle of the bar. And as you're playing it, don't fluff your D string notes or your E string notes, but definitely don't somehow get in the habit of going over to the E string from what you were doing in 14 and 15 and then keep doing that and then obscure the middle voice. So. And of course, set up each new iteration of the subject. Um, what I mean by that doesn't mean you have to like take time and then 
pound at it, but you know, maybe do a little bit of elision with your phrasing so that the entrance is pointed out. So rather than in measure four, you don't go into it, but go away from it so that it can show that it's something coming in new on top. Um, so for example, then we go on to measure eight. It was really clear that the E string comes in there, even where we were just at measure 16. Just always trying to make it clear. Another, oh, here's a lower voice entrance, our first one, um, at measure 24. Our phrases. Um, we have measure 20-21, So make that whole thing a unit and then and same thing again at 34. Or not a low one that time. They're a little different. Have to remember which is which. Another two bar phrase. And then it continues growing and growing. Um, and then we have a kind of a funky version of it in 44. So we yeah. have. because you're going to the other to the E string. Then two bar phrases. And I actually do that on an up bow because it's the end of the tail of dum ba da dum bum bum. And then one bar phrases going to the each new downbeat in 56. Not da dum bum 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 bum, right? But and then, but no surprise. I don't quite know what chord that is. So it's sort of A flat major or something, but then not quite. Some diminished chord there. And then. And that is the end of our first chordal section. I love the fact that this fugue is divided into nice, neat sections. It certainly helps for planning your practicing because you can feel like you do this chunk and this chunk and this chunk and make it all nice. So now we have our first interlude section, the sections of plain eighth notes that intersperse these big chordal sections. And we have start with a couple of two bar phrases. And then pick up to the next one. And then. And then a kind of extra bar, and then more two bar phrases, and another bar to get you back, um, and then more two bar phrases, so you can see all of this is built more or less in two bar phrases to make sure that you're always thinking of the phrase shapes and not just going along playing it perpetual motion style without groupings of notes, thinking about which ones are going away from an emphasized beat and which ones are leading towards the next emphasized beat. 
and I'll, now I'll play some of it more smoothed out so you can see how it ends up being when you're not taking a bunch of time like I was to demonstrate. <laughs> dancey bowing pattern of the separate of the separate bows as opposed to hook because that just makes it more stodgy you could take a little time there if you want and then we have our bass notes our and now it's moving by one measure and then a pedal, we have the same E again and again. So you almost think of the, that E in your mind and your imagination as sustaining through the whole end of that interlude section. So that brings us to our second chordal section. Bach does more with this fugue subject by far than with any of the subjects that he was playing with in the first two fugues. Now he's changed it from major key to minor key, but he's also made it into double fugue. He has one voice enter. But then he has the other voice enter. entering just slightly after the first voice, so they're kind of piled on top of each other instead of politely waiting their turn, as they've done thus far in this fugue and in all of the other fugues. Um, so double fugue here, and then the problem becomes bum, ba, da, da, dum, bum, bum, that you want that to be a down bow, but then you also have the lower voice, which has its emphasis, emphasized bars, which are you know, opposite of the emphasized bars of the top voice, so which way are you going to bow it? It becomes a big, you know, sort of brain twister, jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes you just have to compromise and it's a question in which direction. Not so pleasing to do that on an up bow. And you have to sort of squish your three back and forth to the fifth. kind of flick it, right? But then you're on a down bow here, which is nice. And I do an up bow here. So I'm on a down bow. But then... Yeah, so anyway, this is a really good one to kind of pick it apart. If you want to be really hardcore, you could even take a piece of manuscript paper or maybe do it on your computer screen but I would even just do it by hand and kind of write out the voices and see what everything is if you, you know, instead of being all scrunched into a single staff, if you separated it out into all of these multiple instruments that are doing their thing and really saw what they're, they're each doing and what it means. Here you can also be listening for chords and that can guide some of your decisions. Like for example, in 103, here's an important chord. <laughs> Then another important one. So some of those moments you can decide about bowings, but sometimes it's just as it comes and you just have to do whatever bowing is just going to happen and then make your emphases nonetheless. It doesn't always work out perfectly and I've gone back and forth. I can't even tell you how many different sets of bowings I've had. It's kind of comical, but there's pros and cons to each of them. So uh, figuring out what you like is, is really important. Um, we have, this is just so incredibly dense, this section. It's just, you know, almost a, just puts your brain on overload. So we should really make sure to enjoy our two moments of respite. 107 is a brief one where it gets just a little thinner, a little simpler. And of course, nice friendly major key, which is nice. <laughs> So take every advantage of that, make it nice and light, nice and 
you know, gentle. <laughs> Here, I actually do an up bow on the four note chord so that I can have a down bow. Okay, so I'm letting the, the phrase shape take precedence over my inside out bowing um, for, the, for the quadruple stop. However, I would totally not blame you if you did not want to do that quadruple stop on an up bow. <laughs> Just make sure that when you're doing that, that you still manage to make a good phrase shape. Never get so stuck in the, in the multiple stops that you stop phrasing. That's the worst thing in the world. Just keep singing. And yeah, not just phrasing, singing. This is such a lyrical subject. It's just always, always very uh, melodic, melodic fugue. Okay, our other respite is measure um, 137, so um, after this big, and here's a rare place where I do a double up, because I really, even though it's, somehow I just, I don't want to be at the frog here, so it's not as much about wanting to be down bow here as it is wanting to be where that down bow puts me, so. I'm at the tip. So here he has the four voices. First E string speaks, and then A, and then D, and then G. Sevenths. And then you come back in. is your midpoint, measure 147, where he actually finishes off this big minor key cadence with a major key chord, and you can allow yourself a moment to collect yourself before continuing the journey. So... Now here, I'm starting down bow, because I want to have a down bow here. See, I told you something's always going to be a compromise. Um, and then, of course, lower voice over here in 152. So, and then the trickiest bar of all here at 158. Of course, you're going to be in second position. And then a three which puts you right next to where your three has to go, and then one, three, two, four, this pair of fingered octaves. Like, really, Bach? Um, but there it is. So take time. Luckily, luckily, it's a climactic moment. So you can, um, you know, it's a big gesture. So you can allow yourself a little bit of extra time as long as you do it in a musical way, like you mean to be doing it for musical reasons, but in fact, you know, the hidden truth is that you're actually giving your fingers a little extra time. That wasn't very good, let's see. So basically, I'm rolling the chord in such a way that I'm not going clonk, clonk, not a two plus two kind of romantic era four note chord, but a... Briefly hitting this three two third, and of course shoving my elbow over so I can do those stretches, putting my leaving myself in second position, stretching my one and two downwards so that my three and four can reach where they are, and putting my four down last of all so my two and four don't land together, and I never have all three fingers on all four fingers on the string at the same time. So. And my three lifts off, my four goes down, and this happens. So I, so I start with these two. Lift off three, put down four. But it happens so instantaneously that you don't see all of those steps, but that's the slow-mo version. And then 
Make sure that you don't use too much bow on the first three of those notes so that you have enough left to have a really pretty top C natural because then it's like, hey, not only can I nail this chord, but I can do so beautifully. <laughs> Not taking quite that much time, but that's the idea. And then measure 161. What do we do about this tie? Because generally, a lot of the note values are really implied note values, right? If you have a half note in one voice and two quarters in the other, you're not going to add a slur. The half note is going to end up being only held for a quarter note's worth of time, but we have to imagine the half note. We have to stroke the string as if we're conjuring up a half note. Here we have essentially a dotted half note that happens to go across a bar line. We could have the dotted half note just exist in our imaginations because it's kind of unkosher to return to it because then it's almost like adding a G that Bach didn't write. Bach wrote, he didn't write. And that is the argument against returning, reiterating longer valued notes, uh, is that you're kind of adding a rhythm that doesn't truly exist in the, the composition. However, there's also an argument that says it's really juicy to hear sevenths. And so in this case, I actually do return to the pitch after I've already dropped it. Kind of, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule, right? So. <laughs> And actually, I'm on an up bow. Because so, I want to hear this. So just some of my thoughts. But for a long time, I did not return to the G. And then I decided, oh, what the heck. Um, you know, life is too short, and I missed that seven. So here we are at the second interlude. We have some more two-bar phrases. Now we have a, a sequence that rises from lower to higher. And then end of measure 171. Super cool spot because Bach has hidden the subject inside the eighth notes. Check this out. There it is. So make sure you bring that out. Okay, and then we have a little sequence that has phrasing of five notes. Rising. Oh, 179, here's another hidden subject. And now another rising pattern. And you can let this decay a little bit if you want. This burialage passage is certainly brilliant, but I find that it's too much the same to do the entire section at one volume. So I like to make 186, the first entrance, you know, mezzo forte and then true forte at 193, just to have the second iteration even stronger. So therefore, oh, and same phrasing. Don't let the fact that you're now doing burialage prevent you from still doing beautiful melodic lyrical phrasing and phrase shapes in here, so not because now it's not music, it's just an etude, so it's it. Now rising. And it's always like, okay, which set of notes is it? Because it's slightly different the second time. So then the second time. And the backwards kind of. If that's more comfortable for you, you're not, you know, breaking any laws by doing that. But Baroque bows actually work well the other way, and it gives you a certain kind of stroke instead of. There we go. articulation that's built into doing it down up down up at the frog 
it's not really awkward. You just have to get used to it, and it really does work, and it gives you a kind of sound that you wouldn't have if you were doing the inside-out bowing. Anyways. Or even more on the string. And now here we are at G major, and we're about halfway through the fugue, uh, not literally, but kind of structurally. We're at our midpoint of this whole fugue, and we're, of course, at um, you know one circle of the fifth off from the home key of C major, so this makes sense. So take all the time in the world after that big G chord. Let it ring. Take your time before going on. Now in the third chordal section, Bach turns the fugue subject upside down, just like he did with the little subject of the A minor fugue. So in here he actually says al reverso, so the reverse set of pitches rising and lowering. But still the same phrase shape. of higher voice, higher voice. Here we have lowest voice, then you could say middle voice, even though there are only two voices, and then the higher voice enters. Um, now, so this is just kind of building itself in a normal way. Then measure 217, we have um, actually three three-bar phrases. So, so it's a totally new kind of material. <laughs> And then the next three bars. Next three bars. And then back to kind of, you know, one bar things. A lot of density there. Actually, yeah, that's more than three bars. And then you have the fourth bar and then after that super dense series of uh, measures starting in 226, then in 229, we get our little light two-voice part. A cute little conversation just between the two upper voices, and then they join together. Then the low voice comes in. Which is pretty cool. So even when he's giving you the same subject, that's that same upside down subject, but now he's doing something cool and new with the bass line with that whole chromatic thing. Um, and then we've got a special moment in 242. So like a little, you know, right hand thing on the organ. And then the big pedals, dum bum bum bum. Right? So. You expect that to be a big chord, but no. It's not showing you that the music is still continuing on and that's not really an ending. Then our last interlude section, some two bar phrases. Then one bar phrases. A sequence that's rising. And then There's our hidden fugue subject at the end of 255. Another sequence. Another fugue subject, 265. talked about this burial ash thing, maybe less and then more, down and up is what I would recommend you at least giving it 
um, you know, giving it a good try. And marking for yourself, maybe with a highlighter pen, the pitches that are different this time around as opposed to the first time around, because you are going to get them confused. And it's good to know, OK, this, this is the time it goes to a sharp. This is the time it stays on the same pitch. This is the time it goes down to a flat, or it doesn't go down to a flat, or whatever. And then, of course, it ends a little differently. <laughs> There you have your same um, four note G major chord that we had right before the Al Reverso, but it has a totally different meaning because here it's obviously a five chord of your return to C major, your recapitulation in 288. So this is the exact same music as the whole first section, which means that the fugue might be long, but it's not as long as it appears at first glance because some of it you've already practiced. It's just these first eight bars and you know I just always marvel at Bach's cleverness because here he takes the same material but adds other stuff to it. <laughs> extra voice, um, which is just really cool. So it's the same thing, but sounding different. And of course, with the same phrase shapes. <laughs> and maybe a little bit different character. Somehow does a dom, bom, 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 bom. Sounds a little bit, you know, I'm not quite sure what the right adjective is, but it's that, that deep, voice kind of jolly maybe. Um, so instead of the very opening of the fugue, which starts innocently enough and leaves room for the rest of it to get more and more and more and more complicated. Here we already have been doing all this stuff so now it returns at maybe a slightly more emphatic voice comes in, etc. And it's interesting that Bach ends with the with the upper pitch of his final chord not on the tonic but on the fifth. Um, but I think that just gives it somehow extra space, extra ring. Um, I really like that. So there you have it. Those are some of my thoughts about the Bach C major fugue. I'm Rachel Barton Pine and this is RBP on JSB.